Asalaamu Alaikum everyone and welcome to the next edition of the Pillar to Post podcast. The podcast which aims to bring you insight and stories of Muslims performing at the highest level in sport. We've seen some nice footwork out there as the ball makes its way down the field. But hold on, Pillar 2 post, out of nowhere, amazing! Today's podcast is all about cricket, a game we all love and admire, um, and about a young man who's broken into the very top of cricket in this country, which when you think about it, is no mean feat, because there are only about 18 teams playing professional cricket. Um, So we're talking about only 200 people who are playing this sport right at the top. I like to mention that because... Football is the dominant sport in this country. We have typically 92 professional teams. We only have 18 professional cricket teams. So to make it to the top in cricket is an incredible achievement. And I'm delighted to introduce you to Hassan Azad, who plays for Leicestershire County Cricket Club as an opening bat. Hassan is 26 and has established himself in the Leicester first team as an opening batsman only in the last couple of years. Hassan also bolts, slow right arm, I understand. So bat, left-handed, bowl, right-handed, slightly unusual combination. Um, but he's made it into the first team and today's podcast is all about Hassan sharing his life story and telling us about how he made it. So Hassan, many thanks for joining us today. How is your self-isolated regime coming along? Uh, yes, it's nice to be here, although it's not like I had anywhere else to be uh, under the circumstances. Um, I'm actually quite enjoying it now. Um, I've got a routine, I'm working on my fitness, I've got things that I'm working on in terms of personal development. I started a course on programming uh, on Python uh, that I'm working on and uh, it's just sort of given me a little bit of a target. Uh, it's actually really nice to be around Ami and Baba. Uh, because uh, um, I've just spent the winter playing cricket in New Zealand for about six months. So it's nice to be able to come back and just have that time to spend with my family without having the uh, um, pressure of uh, other commitments. And even social commitments can sometimes lead to you not being able to actually uh, spend some proper time with uh, Ami and Baba. I guess under ordinary circumstances, you would be you would have been preparing for the opening season. Is that right? Yes, uh, it would have been all hands on deck, training every day. Um, yeah, pretty full on, really. How many hours do you need to train as a professional cricketer? It depends. Um, when it gets to around this time of the year, the training gets quite intense because we're preparing for the start of the season, and everyone wants to make sure that we we sort of hit the ground running. Uh, so. Uh, once once the games actually start, uh, it's like four days that you're at the cricket ground from around 9 a.m. till half seven in the evening. Uh, and then you have your one day off after the end of the game and two days before the next game starts. So you have to be quite focused with your training if you want to sort of correct things from game to game. Um, also, we, have, we were meant to have seven weeks straight of uh, four day games. So it was meant to be pretty relentless. Um, but unfortunately not to be now. Now that you mentioned the time, it's interesting to compare it to football, which is 90 minutes of intense activity. But you're talking about four to five days of commitment, um, concentration um, and the physical demands. But I guess the mental challenge must be significant as well. Uh, Absolutely. I think uh, cricket is a really unique game in that regard. It's mentally quite a challenge to be in the right frame of mind at the right time. Uh, Thankfully, uh, I opened the batting for a lot of last season, so um, I didn't have to deal with it it as much. But when I started off the season, for example, I was batting at number three. And uh, that meant that I had sometimes had quite a long wait to go into bat. Um, And... uh, like you're trying to do the right things, you're trying to stay in the present, you're st- trying to focus on each moment as it happens, but uh, it's quite tough not to worry about what could come later, um, and uh, you can get quite anxious waiting to go into bat. Um, so sometimes, uh, yeah, when you do go, go out to bat, you get in the middle, and uh, by the time you face your first ball, it already feels like mentally you've uh, been batting for quite a long time, and it can be quite draining and quite exhausting. At the professional level, do you have mental coaches, therapists, 
counselors to help you with, with that aspect of the game? Uh, yes, we have a sports psychologist who works for Leicestershire. Uh, but even before I got to Leicestershire, uh, we had a resident uh, sports psychologist at Loughborough University, where I studied for my degree. Uh, and that's actually something that people are really starting to latch on to. Um, when I was in the academy uh, at Knotts a long time ago, uh, that was something that uh, was starting to come to the fore a little bit more. But uh, personally, and I think a lot of other people felt the same way, it felt like uh, you didn't really want to admit to um, mental challenges because uh, there, there's always going to be a little bit of stigma around that. Uh, but with, uh, you know, when you look at international cricketers like uh, Jonathan Trott and Marcus Druskotic, who have come forward with uh, stories of their own mental struggles, it sort of uh, uh, validates you uh, admitting the problem and that's the first step to correcting it. So it is a lot more accepted now and people are starting to make use of psychologists a little bit more. So Hassan, can we start at the beginning? Uh, I understand that you were born in Pakistan and then you, your family moved to the UK. Please share your background. So I was born in Quetta in Balochistan where my mum used to live. Uh, my mum's family is, is from Quetta where my uh, grandfather uh, is a doctor. Uh, my mum had a posting in a small town called uh, Mustung, um, where my dad became a teacher at a local cadet college. Uh, he, so we lived in the staff, staff quarters. Um, as soon as I could walk, my dad already had, uh, by the time I could walk, my dad already had a uh, concrete pitch built in our backyard. So we spent a lot of time training there. Um, I don't really remember it much, but uh, my dad tells me that I was quite good fr from when I started. Um, but basically, he was my first coach, and we had quite a nice, quite a nice, relaxed life uh, living in Mustang. Uh, basically, just focusing on cricket and uh, primary education. Um, when I was six, we moved to Karachi because my mom uh, got a job. Uh, she did her residency at the Aga Khan University Hospital. Um, so I started. I joined the cricket academy there uh, when I was nine, I think. Uh, uh, I joined the uh, Rashid Latif Cricket Academy uh, at the under 13s level uh, and that was the next step for me because uh, the coach, uh, like it was uh, quite a big step up. Um, uh, it was pretty much a different level. It was uh, formal coaching and I was playing against kids who were much older and a lot more experienced. Um, so uh, a lot of the cricketers who used to train there used to play first class cricket. Uh, and uh, played for Karachi, Karachi Whites and Karachi Blues um, every year. So it was nice to s sort of see the way they trained, uh, learn from their experiences, uh, and also talk to the coaches. Uh, I always had my dad around, so uh, uh, Baba um, always helped me wherever he could. But that was pretty much my life for the next six years. Uh, I played for Pakistan under 15s uh, when I was 14. Uh, it was an interesting time, uh, quite a steep learning curve. Um, I was uh, 14 years old and staying away from home for three months. And as someone who depended on my parents for pretty much everything, it uh, uh, it was pretty challenging for me um, and uh, quite a tough time. Um, but in hindsight, um, if I look back at it now, uh, I feel like... Uh, I learned so much in that experience and I grew up so quickly during those three months. And also I got to experience playing cricket with uh, some international cricket stars such as Baba Razam. He was the captain of the Pakistan under 15s and he's gone on to become such a superstar. And I, I can always say that, uh, you know, we play cricket together. You know, that's really fascinating. Um, I'm the father of three boys and two of the older ones, they play cricket nonstop at every minute of the day they're out in the garden playing. And I would imagine in India and Pakistan in the, in the subcontinent, um, as the national game, everybody is, is playing cricket. Um, everybody wants to, to be a Dhoni or, or the next Imran Khan. So you've got 500 million boys who, who want to be a cricketer. So, so what made you stand out considering there are so many boys who want to play the game and there's so much competition? What was it about you, Hassan, which gave you the edge? Uh, that's uh, quite an obvious answer for me because, uh, uh, I mean, the, the simple answer is that my dad made me stand out. Uh, my natural tendencies when I was about uh, 
I say 10 to 14, I was quite lazy. I didn't really want to train. Um, there was nothing I'd rather do than uh, just sit on the sofa and play PlayStation for 12 hours a day with my cousins. Uh, I also loved my biryani. I loved my nihari. Uh, so my eating habits weren't the best. <laughs> but uh, my dad, he was, uh, he was on me from the start. He made sure that I trained um, every day as much as I could. He had a passion for the game and he really wanted me to have the best chance that I could possibly have uh, because uh, uh, that was something that he'd always wanted to do uh, and uh, uh, he always thought that he didn't have someone who'd set him up in the right way uh, so he was always at a disadvantage so he wanted me to have the opportunity to pursue it if I wanted to later on in life uh, so whilst I was being lazy uh, I think uh, it allowed it did give me the head start I need, that I needed so that when, when I did realize that I wanted to do this, I already had the base and the platform and the years of practice behind me. Uh, so we still bump into people from our old flats in Karachi. Uh, from uh, when I was six and we used to go out at seven in the morning when the roads were empty to just have a hit on the street. Uh, cricket is such a big sport over there that we used to have uh, random people, uh, shopkeepers, uh, whoever had any spare time, uh, they just uh, used to come out and field for us. So suddenly I'd have a full net session in the middle of a, a city street with uh, proper cricket balls and uh, it seemed absolutely normal. It's really interesting to hear your story because if you look at success in any walk of life, hunger and passion seems to be a prerequisite for achieving anything. Um, in your case, you've got an inspired parent. But I think you're also, I think you're also downplaying yourself and your role in all of this. You know, undoubtedly, a lot of credit goes to your father, alhamdulillah, for, for having the determination. But you know, waking up at seven a.m. for a little boy every day is not easy. So, massive credit goes to you, Hassan, for your determination as well. Um, and you know, just thinking about that, at what point did you think that, you know, I'm I'm really good at this and I can make a career out of this? Uh, yes, I'm pretty sure I must have rebelled at some point. I mean, my dad, uh, my uh, Baba, tells me stories all the time of uh, when uh, I uh, ran at him with a cricket bat because he didn't want to play cricket anymore. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it was challenging, especially as a teenager, uh, because uh, obviously to have the commitment of, uh, you know, 15 hours of cricket every week on top of uh, academics does get a bit challenging. Uh, and especially in terms of uh, uh, as a teenager when you want to socialize and meet lots of people. But uh, uh, thankfully, I had my parents to keep me on the right track. Um, the other thing is I used to be afraid of fast bowling, <laughs> um, uh, especially when I was uh, younger. So 10 to, I think till I was about 12, I was terrified of getting hit by a cricket ball. So uh, playing with uh, 15 to 16 year olds, that wasn't really ideal. Uh, I remember... One time I was playing a men's game, uh, age 12, and uh, came up against um, a guy called Sohail Khan, who's uh, played for te played uh, Test cricket for Pakistan since. Um, at the time, he was about 18 or 19. He had just won a uh, King of Speed competition in Karachi, bowling at about 85 miles per hour. Uh, so for me, as a 12-year-old, um, it was my worst nightmare. Um, so I was standing at the crease, uh, Absolutely, uh, absolutely, uh, uh, um, really terrified. But uh, I remember uh, talking to myself, um, and I sort of told myself that if uh, you know, if if I wanted to play cricket, then I would just have to get used to it, and I couldn't control anything that was going to happen. So I might as well just, you know, give up control, and uh, the rest is history. I think. Uh, I started to play a few shots, um, got a few away, got a few out of the middle. Uh, it was fun. It was really enjoyable. Uh, there were quite a few people watching, so uh, it was nice uh, living off. I was almost sort of feeding off the crowd and living off that adrenaline. And uh, you turn around and suddenly you're on 40. And I think that was my highest score up until that point. And uh, I was just thinking, you know what? This isn't that bad. Uh, I can actually do this. Uh, so uh, that set me up. It gave me an experience that I could go back to later on in life when I was uh, when I thought that I was struggling, um, but it gave me something to sort of um, 
you know, an experience that I could rely on to give me some hope. You know, I find that fascinating. I mean, you're 12 years old and you're facing Sehel Khan. You said he's 19. So you weren't even a teenager and you're facing a man. I find that incredible that, you know, you managed to overcome him. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I'd say that's one of the uh, defining moments that I look back on uh, that really uh, spurred me on to play, continue playing cricket and continue to strive to be good at cricket. Uh, in terms of believing I could play professionally, I don't think I ever really believed it until it happened. Um, you know, I played in Pakistan, moved to England, played quite a lot at Knotts over here. And whilst I was at Knotts, um, it always seemed out of reach. Uh, it seemed like a distant goal because of the competitive element to it. Because there are so many kids playing cricket here and they're all so well coached. Um, they've had years of uh, technical training, you look at the skill element of some of the players and uh, you do s sort of compare yourself to them and think, am I ever going to be that good? Um, I I think I only really believe that I could play professionally about two years ago. Uh, um, actually, two years before I signed on with Leicestershire uh, when I was at university and we played uh, um, against first-class counties at the start of every year. Uh, and... Uh, uh, we played against Knotts in my first year of uni after I'd just been released by them. Uh, so uh, they had a star-studded lineup. They had Jake Ball, Luke Fletcher, Samit Patel. Um, and uh, I uh, sort of just, um, you know, went out without fearing the consequences. I ended up scoring 99. I nicked off to Jake Ball uh, on 99. And I think... Uh, um, my teammates were more disappointed than I was, uh, and even the Knotts boys, because I'd grown up uh, playing cricket with them, a lot of them were quite disappointed for me. Um, so, but yeah, in terms of confidence, I don't think I don't think I'm one of those people who are born with confidence. I think uh, that's something that I've sort of built up over the years uh, and reinforced with experiences, and going back to those experiences as often as I can um, to sort of um, give myself that boost at the right times. You know, isn't confidence such a fascinating thing? You look at people who appear to be really successful and who are very confident and are at the top of their trade and CEOs and all sorts of people, you know, really successful um, in the conventional sense. But you know, when you talk to them in private, you realize that a lot of people doubt themselves and, and they, they have this fear of getting found out and you know people talk about imposter syndrome and and how it's more common than people realize even amongst people who we think are hugely successful um, and, and i guess confidence in sport is even more critical oh yes it matters so much i think uh, it's one of those things um uh, it can completely transform your outlook uh, and transform your results as well. Uh, it's funny that you mention imposter syndrome uh, because uh, it's only a few weeks ago that I watched a TED talk on it. And the key concept was that a lot of people have the feeling that they don't belong, but it depends on how you react to that feeling. So if you let it overcome you and doubt yourself to the point that you can't execute any skill and you don't put yourself in challenging situations because you think that you're going to fail then it becomes a negative and it stops you from achieving what you want to achieve. But if you look at it as a challenge uh, and think, what can I do so that, it, so that I do feel like I fit in? What can I do to make sure that my skills are at the same level that other people ex expect from me, but that, that I expect from myself? And that can really help you to achieve a lot more in terms of your personal goals and ambitions. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. Really, really interesting to see how the mental game dominates um, at the top level. I wanted to ask you something else about how the game is. Um, you came over to Pakistan. You came over from Pakistan. Do you see many differences with how the play is in Pakistan compared to how play is in England? And would you say? Um, there's more natural talent in Pakistan and perhaps players are maybe overcoached here? Uh, yes, I think uh, the game over there is so different. Um, in many ways, um, every cricketer is a product of his 
or her environment. Uh, and it's impossible to escape that because uh, in a game like cricket, so much depends on the conditions. So, for example, uh, over here, you can get your hands through through the ball because uh, the ball comes on a little bit quicker. Uh, and you have to play a little bit later because it moves off the surface and it swings in the air. Whereas uh, in Pakistan, where I grew up, um, when you're playing against seamers, uh, because the ball comes on so slowly and uh, it's so flat and uh, uh, almost uh, not quite easy, but it's a different game. So you can get get away with throwing your hands at the ball and uh, you generate power uh, by using your wrists and your uh, your hands by getting them faster through the ball. Um, over here, you have to maintain a, uh, a high elbow, uh, give it the full face of the bat. And, uh, you know, growing up in Pakistan, I just wasn't quite used to it. Uh, so uh, in terms of uh, the coaching that you get here, I think uh, a good coach is a good coach wherever you are in the world because they'll realize what your strengths are, uh, what makes you unique, and they'll try to promote that without, uh, without uh, sort of... Uh, overpowering your experience with uh, how they handle things and how they used to play when they were cricketers. Um, so even in uh, in both Pakistan and, and in England, I've had good coaches and bad coaches. And the thing about the best coaches is that uh, uh, they won't stop you from doing what comes naturally. Um, um, so for example, the coaches here at Leicestershire have been really good at... Uh, practicing, um, helping me practice uh, what makes me unique. So I'm really good with my wrists, which comes from my background in Pakistan, um, but also giving me that, uh, um, you know, that feedback when I needed the most. So uh, um, just that little tap on the shoulder, that little reminder to keep doing the basics really well, to have that ability to play the ball late, give it the full face, uh, have your head balanced, uh, so that you're not falling over your shot, uh, you're not falling across it too much. Um, uh, also, I think uh, it's up to the player a lot nowadays to be able to discern what's being said. Uh, so if someone comes up to you and gives you some advice, you have to be, you have, your, 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 you know yourself better than anyone else. So you have to be able to uh, understand whether that advice is relevant to you and if it's going to help you or if it's going to hinder you. Um, and I think that's the main thing that I've learned over the years. So Hassan, can you tell me about your promotion to Leicestershire's first team? How has that been for you? Oh, yes, uh, it's been incredible. It's such a surreal experience. Um, you know, considering that uh, about two years ago, um, I had pretty much given up on cricket. <laughs> I was in my final final year of university and I was quite demoralized because I've been trying to make it um, for a number of years, you know, giving it everything, training hard, still trying to do well in academia. Um, and uh, it had really started affecting my personal, uh, personal life because uh, um, after so many years, you do start to wonder whether it's worth it, whether, you know, whether you're actually going to get somewhere. Um, but ultimately I decided to just give it one final go and not worry about the consequences. Uh, and I think that's the most important lesson I learned from that is that as soon as you stop worrying about what might happen, um, that's when my game went to another level. Um, I had a week where I played a game against Oxford University where I got 100 on Monday in a one-day game, uh, double 100 on Tuesday and Wednesday in a two-day game. Uh, and the week after that, I got a trial at Leicestershire and got uh, 180 in my first game playing for them. So uh, I think it just comes from a shift in perspective. Uh, as soon as you stop worrying about what might happen, um, it uh, sort of it takes you to another level. I know when you're 10 years old, you play cricket for the joy of playing cricket. Uh but when you're a professional, you've got you've got crowds, you've got pressure, you've got expectations, you've got measurements, obligations, training, of course. How do you keep hold of that joy? Hassan, you said something very um, profound a few minutes ago. Um, it's about not worrying about the consequences. It's, it's almost like the handbrake has come off. 
is that what the turning point was for you? Would you say is that what took you from a very good player to an expert? Uh, I think the joy for me comes from uh, like like you said before, like uh, just not worrying about the consequences. Uh, because I love the game myself. Like uh, I absolutely, there's nothing that gives me more pleasure than just batting. Um, but what can get in the way of that enjoyment is when you start worrying about um, how it might affect your life. And uh, when you start thinking of it as a career and you start thinking in terms of, uh, um, you know, what could happen if I don't have a good day today? Uh, that's when the joy goes away. Um, for me, as an opening batsman in four-day cricket, if I make a mistake on the first ball of the game, uh, I could have two days to think about it. <laughs> it and uh, as soon as you fall into that trap, um, there's no going back. So really, the best players are those who can learn their lessons and analyze their mistakes. But then you have to be really clinical in letting go of that as soon as you can. Uh, because as soon as you start letting it affect you mentally, uh, that's game over. Um, so uh, I think the higher up you go, the more you have to be in control of your emotions. Um, cricket is a condensed form of life, really. And uh, as soon as you start thinking about trying to control things that are not in your control, for example, if, um, if I get a ball that I can't do anything about uh, and I get out, uh, if I start thinking about what could have happened, um, then that's really not a healthy way of uh, living. And then uh, the next time I go out to bat, uh, I wouldn't be able to focus on uh, performing at my opt optimum level, which is something that I can control. So thank you so much for sharing that. It, to me, it really seems like a condensed form of life. And, you know, we're all affected by obstacles and problems and, and challenges. And I guess uh, if you can brush off those challenges and, and, and stand up again and, and still take a step forward, these are the the individuals who who make it in life. Yes, it's uh, interesting that you mentioned that um, because you know with the lockdown, uh, I've had the time to watch a lot of TED talks, and I saw one on the importance of denial as a human survival instinct. Uh, so you could think about all the things that could affect us in any given moment, um, such as say the roof caving in, or you know getting run over as you cross the street, or just having a disease where you um, you could be healthy and you just keel over, and uh, the next moment you're no more. Uh, but for you to function as a person, your brain has a mechanism where it can ignore 99% of um, threats to your existence. And the reason it does that is that you, so that you can continue to live your life and do the things that you need to do to survive and process other things. So in some ways, denial is what keeps us going. And the people who can uh, live life the best are people who can brush off uh, all of these threats. So Hassan, tell me about the dressing room. How have you found interacting with your teammates and the fact that you're Pakistani, that you're a Muslim, has that uh, been a challenge? Um, yes, in terms of differences, I think uh, as a Muslim, um, there are certain things that we can't get involved with on the same level. So for example, uh, um, I'm not going to... Um, have any alcohol anytime that I go out with my teammates um, but it's really interesting that uh, the the best dressing rooms and the best cultures are those which are accepting of those differences and I've been incredibly lucky that anywhere that I've played cricket I haven't had to change anything about myself so that's at uh, Loughborough University at any of the cricket clubs that I've played at and especially in the Leicestershire dressing room um, I feel like uh, I can be myself without having to worry um, especially at Leicestershire, uh, we had Muhammad Abbas from Pakistan as the overseas player last year. And uh, we used to have a corner of the dressing room where we could pray uh, in Jamaat. So if you consider that we are surrounded by our teammates um, um, and, uh, you know, they're not Muslim, um, but we felt so comfortable um, and they felt so comfortable with us that we... We had our own space. We didn't have to find a different room. We just we could just be comfortable within our own beliefs. Um, and, uh, you know, even though religion is such a private thing, I don't think we had any problems expressing it. Um, uh, and especially uh, like our head coach, Paul Nixon, 
uh, any time I go up to meet him and he uh, greets me with by saying assalamu alaikum and I say wa alaikum assalam and he's really good at using his inshallahs and his mashallahs so uh, you know uh, absolutely feel at home at Leicestershire <laughs> that's really funny it's funny it, you know the whole issue of identity and who to support is, is intriguing as a Pakistani you know we have these conflicts about who to support and I'm second generation and I even though I was born in the UK, I support Pakistan. As I look at my three boys, and the older two, they are diehard England fans. And um, it's really intriguing how uh, you identify with, 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 your, with your team. And what is even more interesting is, is to see two British-born Pakistanis um, now in the England team, Moin Ali and Adil Rashid, uh, playing at the highest level. It makes you proud when you see a person of Muslim origin integrate in a sport which is very white, very establishment, very elitist. Um, it, it's, it's heartening to see. Um, yes, I think that's the beauty of the game, that it brings all these people together. It's a shame you see the political atmosphere at the minute and it's getting more and more divisive. Uh, but I really don't want to see it start to affect cricket. It's such a unique sport where uh, you get people from the Caribbean, uh, Pakistanis, Indians, uh, uh, you know, European British people all come together and work towards a common cause. Um, and I really wouldn't want to see anything happen to that. Um, I think one of the it's one of those things. But I'm just really lucky that um, there haven't been any problems at any of the clubs that I've played in, and it's been quite harmonious. So Hassan, what's going to happen in the future? Are you thinking about the national team? I'd love to play for England. That would be a dream come true. Um, I was the second highest uh, run scorer in the county championship last year. And if that were to happen again, um, I'd have a good chance of making it to the Lions, which is the next step up uh, before playing for England. Uh, but for me to function as a person, I know that I can't think too far ahead. Uh, I'm at my best when I'm not thinking about the consequences whether good or bad, so I need to focus on the next ball. Uh, if it happens, great, but if not, I'll be trying my best to just focus on living in, in the present moment. You know, it's really wonderful to hear that, and we are thrilled to have someone like you performing at the highest level. I know my two boys, they, they're always looking for role models, and you are one of those. Talking of role models, do you know Moin and Adil Rashid? Have you spoken to them personally? Not yet, uh, but I have heard some really nice things about them. I've heard that they're incredibly humble people. And uh, what I can say is there's such a lovely community, community that uh, everyone gets along. Um, I was playing a second team match against Yorkshire when I was 19. Uh, and they had a guy called Muin Ashraf, uh, who's a fast bowler. Uh, and I remember that he, uh, when, he, when he was bowling at me, he'd sledge me in English. Uh, just sort of saying, you know, I'm going to get you out and uh, you're no good, you're going to get out soon. Um, and then uh, when uh, no one was listening, he'd come up to me and speak to me in Urdu and he'd say, you know what, you're doing really well, just keep going. Um, just keep going for another half an hour and you'll get 100. So, uh, yeah, that's one of the, my uh, memories from uh, playing against him a few years ago. So, Hassan, I just wanted to say again, we're really thrilled and excited to see you on this journey. And I would say proud as well to see somebody of a Pakistani background, a Muslim background, make it to professional cricket and perform at the level you're performing at, but maintain your faith, maintain your respect for your background and your culture. It's, it's, a, it's a great achievement. Um, so thank you again for coming on the show and sharing your life story. And we look forward to seeing you in England Cricket White soon. Uh, thank you so much. Um, you know, I really enjoyed doing this as well. It's been lovely to chat. And uh, inshallah, I hope that we can talk about it again sometime.